Okay, good day to all. Hope you all are well. And Brother John Glass, good afternoon to you. Those of you in Southeast Asia with me, uh, good evening to you. And to all others, uh, good day, whatever time zone you're in. Um, I'm going to start us out in a word of prayer in just a moment, and uh, we will proceed from there, excited about the content we're going to cover today. So uh, let's start with a word of prayer, and then we'll jump straight in right after. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you greatly for the privilege of looking at these things that we're going to consider together this, this day, this evening, and we're praying for your help, very much asking you to give us strength, wisdom, understanding to process these things that we look at together. I'm praying specifically today that what we talk about here would go beyond the academic, certainly some academic components here, but that it would be profoundly transformative in our thinking about your word, our understanding of your word, and most significantly how to communicate your word effectively to other people. Pray that you would empower our time here. Give us help. We ask this all in your son's name and for his sake. Amen. Okay. Uh, well, I'm hoping that the connection is okay today. Let me know if it's not clear enough, and I'll try to do what I can on this end, but um, see what we can do. Um, and very much looking forward to what we're going to discuss. I'm going to wait on one of the topics I wanted to discuss, which was introducing the... Uh, discussion about the paper and the direction of the class in general. I'm going to wait just because we're waiting for other people to join us. So I, I have noticed that sometimes people come in maybe in the next five minutes or something, and that's understandable. So I'll wait until more people are coming in so that I make sure everyone has heard those comments because it is very, very relevant to our class here. Um, and if someone doesn't mind just giving me a comment to confirm here how the connection is sounding, want to make sure that everything's working okay there. Um, great. Very good. Okay. Here's what I want to do today. I'm going to send you uh, in just a second via the chat. I will send you the overview of our discussion and what we're going to look at together in, uh, in this discussion today. We're going to look at a, a book that I mentioned earlier. You also read it, hopefully got to it in your reading uh, that was assigned for today. And it's from Gonzalez, Theological Education. Okay, so I just pasted this in here. You see it in the chat, and I've given you here kind of my overview of the notes. This is the general outline we'll follow, and this might help you keep up with what we're doing as we go forward. Uh, but the book, in case you have not seen it already or come across it somewhere else, I'll put it up here. Uh, it's the same author of the two volume the two volume uh, history, church history, uh, and it's the story of doctrine. That, if you have uh, had the opportunity to work with any, is excellent. Uh, really, really good two volume coverage of the history of theology. Uh, the only problem there is that Mr. Gonzalez is in the United Methodist Church, and so that does show when you get into the latter part of second volume especially. He goes more in a, a um, ecumenical direction, so he thinks that all of the different branches of together. So the views start to show up as you get late to his work, but particularly volume one and even the first part of volume two, it's just excellent. Um, and I, I, to me, Mr. Gonzalez represents very effectively kind of the ideal I want to shoot for in my own theological writing. He is a very, very respected thinker and, and as a scholar, very respected. And yet the way that he writes is in no way off-putting, okay? It's very enjoyable, easy writing. It's just, it, it's fun to read. And I think that's a thing for us to shoot for both in writing and in our teaching. And I'll come back to that principle or that idea later on as we keep on discussing tonight. Uh, but here I'm putting up the copy of, or the, the, just the image of the book if you wanna see what it looks like. Unfortunately, it's not cheap. Uh, it exists for Kindle. It's $20, um, and it's not a hugely long work, okay? So it's, in a, it's, it's, it's an expensive book for considering the length and so forth. I would say it's worth it. Uh, if you can, I would say get it and read it. I mean, I, I really enjoyed this book. 
It's a very delightful book to read. Uh, and I gave you the last chapter. I gave you the conclusion chapter. So honestly, you have kind of the best chapter of the book. Um, it, that, that last chapter has the conclusions that I thought really helped, will help transform my thinking and drive me in new directions. Um, but I'll say this, I'll give this to you as an offer. If you are looking at the cost of this book or just other parts of it, and it's got a little off-putting because it's so expensive. If you come by any means, if you come to the PRISM conference, um, which is coming up at BJNBC October 2nd to 5th, uh, we'll be dedicating the new building. We'll have lots of other sessions and stuff such, such like that. If you come, if you're here, and some of you I know are coming, I will make a way. I'll, I'll loan you my devices. I have it on Kindle. I'll loan you my devices. I'll make sure that you can read it while you're here if you want to. And it's not a very long book. You could definitely read it while you're here. Okay, so there's my best shot at an offer if, uh, if you're looking at the book. All that being said, it'd probably be cheaper to buy the book than to buy a ticket to come here. So that's that. Uh, the highlight in the Dropbox file, Brother John Glass, those are mine. Um, and just as I was reading through the things that stuck out at me. So that's correct. In your reading, some of the, some of the lines were highlighted. Uh, but I think what, you'll, what I'll say is if you are personally involved in theological education, for you particularly, I think this book really could be worth it. Uh, there are specific things I will do differently because of my reading this book in the way that, in the way that I'm working through my own teaching. Um, and that's just here teaching at BJMBC in the Philippines, what I'm doing here. Okay, so with that introduction, uh, let's go, and I'm going to go to chapter one. I will tell you I have highlights, extensive highlights from the entire book, every chapter, and I have those in a Word document, which is um, quite long. There's a lot of information in there, and then I took my own notes from the book and things like that. I'm not going to give that to you now uh, because you'll be tempted to just read it, and then the lecture will be really boring. So what I'll do is I'll teach from the document, and then I'll skip over probably more than 50% of what's there. And if you're still interested, I will drop that document in the Dropbox folder for this class and you can pull it up. Okay, so that's there if you're not able, uh, if you're not able to pick it up. Okay, um, so let me go ahead and open that up and let's go forward. Uh, Just checking. Okay, can you hear me better now? Okay, my apologies. Don't know where uh, where that happened. Okay, good. Um. Let me see what I can, give me just a brief second. I'm gonna just uh, make one adjustment and I'll be right back. So give me a quick second. Let's proceed. Um, so chapter one, he's starting out and he's talking about the very beginning. He's talking about the early parts of the church. Uh, if you wanna think of the New Testament period really. And he's gonna say, he'll, he'll, he'll give us comments like this. In the New Testament era, we have little information. Uh, the seven deacons are supposed to be ministering to the aids of the wit eight of the widows, at least two of them, Stephen and Philip, end up preaching. Um, and he, from what he gives us in chapter one, that's kind of all that we have in terms of theological education in the New Testament era and the early church. This is one place right here at the beginning. This is one place where I would actually beg to differ a little bit from him. Um, I think the New Testament is giving us quite a bit more than that when it comes to theological education and things that come to my mind on this point without having spent a lot of time on it. Uh, just if you want to think of 2 Timothy 2, 2, the things which you have heard, then give those over to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. I mean, I, to me, that's a cornerstone of theological education. But you can go far beyond that. You can go into the Old Testament, and my understanding of the Old, Tem Old Testament company of the prophets in 1 Kings 13 is that you've got some kind of theological education idea there. Uh, you've got Jesus' personal example as he's working with the disciples, and I think that's representing a theological education process. Certainly, Paul's example with training protégés, so he didn't just, quote, do ministry, but part of his ministry was to also train people 
who would go on to have ministry. And then if you think of the New Testament, you've got three pastoral epistles that are basically doing theological education for people who are going to be in ministry. Okay, so I, I would argue in all of those that definitely we've got a strong set of data points across the New Testament for theological education. And um, where I am confessing in this lecture, I am relying heavily on Mr. Gonzalez because I am not a historian. Well, in the same way, I would suggest um, he's a historian, but not so much on the, the New Testament or the biblical exegesis side. So chapter one is not the strongest in that sense uh, in terms of the biblical data on theological education. I would make a passing point as we go by here, as far as the New Testament information goes, if you are not in the process as you do ministry, if you are not um, consciously, purposely, or purposefully, and deliberately working on training the person who's going to replace you in ministry, then your ministry has a, a massive gap. <laughs> and I think the biblical information points us there that we don't just think of, we cannot just think of pastoring and then, oh, I guess when I get up in my like late 50s to 60s, okay, maybe now it's time to start thinking about who's gonna be my replacement. But it starts all the way, anytime you are in ministry, you are actively not only seeking to train the people in your church in general, but to specifically pour into people that you, you suspect God might be calling into full-time ministry. Um, that comment being made, I'll, uh, I'll proceed with the rest of chapter one, and that is the, the idea or the, what, just what he, he starts to process. The minimum requirements from what we can tell in the early years of the church is that basically we're talking about people leading worship because they know how to read. So from what we can tell about literacy in the, the Greco-Roman cities in the area, area which is which is where Christianity starts. Uh, the estimate is something like five to 10% of people may have actually know, known how to read. And within that, then you don't obviously lead worship unless you can read, because remember, we've got to also correct the way we're thinking through stuff. Um, people aren't, they're not walking into church with a Bible under their arm either, right? In other words, one of the core things that happens when you go to church is this is your opportunity to hear one of the New Testament epistles or one of the Old Testament books read, okay, because that's your only access to the word. Um, unless, you know, you, you maybe have a scrap of something that you've memorized or that you've written down, okay. But this is, this is a core part of what's happening. So within that smaller group of people, the people who know how to read and therefore who are able to lead, um, those people probably in general are going to have been trained in pagan schools for the most part. Okay, so they're going to have come from a background where they were, they were studying the secular orders, they were studying the classical Greek writers, and so the interpretation of scripture, assuming kind of a... Um, hoping that you can hear me again, kind of dipping in and out. Um, they're coming into these texts, assuming in many ways that their own understanding of scripture or their reading of scripture, excuse me, I'll back up here. They're coming into their interpretation of scripture on the assumption that the way that they read the poets or the way that they read these Greek philosophers is the way now they're going to interpret scripture. So that uh, their assumptions about canons of interpretation are going to be dependent on things like allegory, assumptions about extending um, meaning through those means.
Okay, I'll keep on going and then just let me know if you're completely losing me. I'm pausing because I don't know if you hear me or not. <laughs> My apologies. Um, okay, so in this case, then many of these people from what we're, we're, we're understanding the, the bad habits that develop in the early interpretation of the church, the early years, allegory is coming out of that basis. Um, and therefore, as far as we know, in the early years of the church, there is no indication of any kind of schools for training bishops, no indication of schools for training pastors, and so forth, because just the early part, these early centuries, basically the church is trying to survive, more or less. It's more about the survival of the church than it is um, being able to do the higher order things that we assume. Two major figures within this period, Augustine and Ambrose. Uh, Augustine, both Augustine and Ambrose are saved as well-educated people. Okay? And that probably represents the general trend during the era. Uh, the general trend during the era being that people come out of an educated rhetorical background, Augustine particularly, trained in the classics, trained in rhetoric. And so he steps into ministry and they bring the tools that they have from that side of things straight into what they do with ministry. Okay, Ambrose is a well-educated person. He comes into the church, he's baptized, and actually in his case, he was immediately ordained, from what we know, ordained as a bishop. Um, so he he's, receives this calling without any kind of uh, preparation. And in his case, then, he turns to a, a teacher, Simplician, who, from what he knew, was very well-educated and knowledgeable, and starts to rely on him to help him as a mentor. And that became the basis, then, of Ambrose education. In the case of Augustine, which is a little bit later on, I, it kind of goes the other direction. Augustine gets interested in theology kind of as an unbeliever. And as time goes on, then Augustine, studying out of curiosity, kind of almost philosophically, then comes more and more to be pulled into Christianity. And he goes the other direction, now as an educated person, because he's already well-educated, then he has a position. So in the early case, early case of the church, we're finding sometimes people that have a position before they're educated, other people that get educated, and then they receive a position because they're educated. It can go either direction. But either way, what we're talking about are people that already had education in rhetoric outside of the church before they ever came in. Part of what's happening in this era with um, the training is that the bishops, as they are growing in their as they're growing in their influence and the extent to which they minister, they can't keep up. It's almost like a parallel to what's going on in Acts when the apostles reach a point. They say, "Well, we're going to ordain." Uh, deacons just because we can't keep up with all the responsibilities. And the method then of these bishops is to ordain presbyters, the presbyters to take the responsibility, kind of like a, an aid to the bishop, or maybe in our context, we might say uh, assistant pastor kind of idea, and also to represent him when the bishop is away. And that then means that the bishops need to work to train these presbyters, put them in a place where they can effectively minister. So they're setting up something like study programs under the super supervision, under, under these bishops, so that the presbyters can be prepared to do the work as an assistant to the bishops. And that's the closest thing that we know of in this era that is um, something of a training process. As far as the bishop's training, as far as we know, there's nothing going on except that a bishop who was going to be elected would, would customarily write a declaration of faith. And through this then, writing out his faith, his beliefs and theology and so forth, they would call in other bishops who would come in and ordain him and give some kind of witness that, you know, yes, your theology is in line with what the church believes, okay? So in these cases then, uh, you've got some kind of grid or some kind of filter for who's going to be able to receive a position in, in taking a bishopric. Uh, bishopric, that's, a, that's a, a later set of terminology, but we'll use it, the, the area that he's over. The closest thing to an official school 
would be something like Justin's school or in Alexandria where Origen eventually is teaching. Um, some places where there's something like a, a, a broader school, but here's the thing, they're not so much for training pastors as these are places where uh, someone, Justin in his case especially, is he's presenting Christianity apologetically. And so they're talking not just about theology, but other departments of learning as well, drawing people in. And it's kind of a broader place of education, not just focused on theology. Um, and in some ways, then there are some similarities, but it's also, it's also different, okay? It's not so much primarily similarities to what we do today, I'm sorry. It's not primarily for training pastors, but it's more than that. It's also for studying the Christian faith in general and, 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 and articulating it effectively. Okay, um, I'm gonna pause here and just look through questions that we have here. Uh, yeah, Brother John Glass, this is how we did my ordination. I think that there's some similarities here to way, the way we think about ordination in general. Um, good, the Great Commission is a fundamental principle for theological education. That's excellent, good. Because uh, what you're recognizing there is it's not just go get people saved, which is I think sometimes the way that we talk about the Great Commission. But the Great Commission is broader than that as calling people out, uh, they're saved, but then you're also making disciples. So you're also training people to be effective. And that's core and critical to what has to happen in the Great Commission. Um, good. I will come, Brother John Glass, to what you talked about approaching the scriptures from a modernistic perspective. Um, I would comment here as far as a, a church history or a historiography discussion, just to say, and this is a little bit postmodern myself, I guess, but um, all of us historically, all of us have always done it. Okay? And if, if modern, postmodernism has taught us anything good, and it probably has, one of the things it would teach us is to be self-conscious and aware of how my culture affects the way I think about things. The negative part of uh, postmodernism would be just to accept that and say, well, we can't do anything better. So just you know, be your era and that's good or be who you are and, and that's good. Um, as a Christian, kind of a chastened, what's well, called a, a chastened foundationalist, then I come in and say, uh, yes, my era affects me and that gives me cause to be careful and to restrain my thinking to scripture and let scripture be the guide. Um, good. Okay. And then comment here was the handwritten word of God widely circulated in those days. A couple of comments here. Number one, certainly we recognize this. Any copy of the word of God you have besides memorizing it is, is just going to be a handwritten copy for sure. Um, and I want to say here kind of a yes and no. It's certainly more widely circulated than, let's say, the Jewish Old Testament, right? It's more widely circulated than the Old Testament would have been, because if you look at the textual history of the New Testament, there's just an explosion of the manuscripts right after. So, I mean, very soon after the documents exist, they're being copied. And that's part of the richness of the New Testament manuscript tradition. It's just the sheer wealth of copies that are out there. But you also recognize that as far as a complete copying of the manuscripts, that's gonna be rare. You know, nobody's going to you know, go home and on their shelf, they're gonna have all the New Testament documents for quite a while, all perfect copies with nothing missing. Probably more realistic is going to be, somebody has you know, like a page or two <laughs> out of one of the epistles that maybe they copied down from someone else, their friend had a copy and they sat there and they copied what they could. But these are only, of course, people that are themselves literate and people themselves that can write. Okay? So they're kind of specialists. But, but what would be spreading rapidly would be copies like that, kind of incomplete copies. Lots of memorization too. Good. Very good. Okay. Uh, that was stage one, chapter one. And that's just the very earliest period. I'm saying basically Christ to 150. I mentioned uh, people that come much later, even Augustine. Uh, so much, much later in his case, uh, end of the 300s. But anyway, this is the, this is the idea, uh, just to kind of give a general overview of the first part. The second stage, chapter two for Gonzalez anyway, is the catechumenate. And this is taking us an additional step, kind of a process of filtering candidates for entering the church. Okay. So here's here's kind of the rationale behind this. Um, 
the concern is that you have people who are entering the church, okay, not just Jewish, but Gentile, who have no background at all in, let's say, in, in the, the Old Testament and in the moral expectations, the moral demands of Yahweh, and furthermore, just the, um, the whole framework of thinking that comes with that. And so how do you incorporate such people into the body? If they show interest, how do you know when they really are sufficiently grounded that you can call them Christians, both Jew and Gentile? How do you filter out Jews or Jewish background people who are not really stepping away from the law or Gentile people who have no understanding of the basics of the Old Testament? So here's a method then to make sure that someone before they're baptized and incorporated into the church, make sure that they recognize what they really are trusting in before they join. And another piece of that puzzle is to say, um, you're making sure that uh, someone understands the persecution that they may face if they come into the church, making sure that someone understands that if they come in, they're going to pay a price and that they're really going to continue with it. So the catechumenate is a process where, at least by Justin's time, and then uh, going forward, so uh, possibly middle of the second century, but, but further on for sure, kind of a system of preparation for baptism. And it would last an extended time, maybe a couple of years, for people really to have an understanding of, of the full background of what they need to know. Um, there's a question here that relates very much to what I'm saying. In what way, someone's asking, is discipleship different from theological education? And it's a really good question. Um, so the, the question here is one that, that Gonzalez addresses later on, and I'll talk about more. It's a distinction I would be happy to collapse to blot out the distinction between theological education, which we think of more as academic and um, grounding people in the faith, which we call discipleship, I'd be happy to blot out that distinction and make that a continuous thing. That I think we could do much better if before, um, or let's say in the early parts of someone, let's say joining a church, we made sure they were grounded on basic fundamentals of theology. Good. Continuum is a, is a good word, a very good word to use here. Okay. So under that heading then, the idea of the catechumenate, um, a couple of years, this could be, this, uh, Gonzalez says this differs by place, depends on where, but kind of as a general outline, um, it's a long process. Okay, where someone starts out by first stage, stage one, expressing interest, that they're interested in joining, and that they will work towards that. Okay? So they can attend, but they can't really take communion yet. And then after a period of time, then eventually they become part of the church. But getting there has multiple stages. Okay? Um, so when they get up to the end, then they're going to have questionings. Okay, up to baptism, which is probably going to happen, or happen around Easter. Um, they're going to have questionings about, you know, the Lord's Prayer, the creed, aspects of doctrine. And it's going to be pretty significant, and it's going to be pretty, pretty, um, pretty demanding. And when they get to the end, then, uh, they are incorporated into the church. Okay? They are called enlightened ones. And there's some interesting, really interesting insights here you can read from our notes um, that talk about that. But some of this is to recognize that um, the, the process of getting here, getting into the church, getting to baptism is really rigorous at this point and probably has a lot to do with persecution, the demands of persecution, and then making sure that this new faith, not new we understand, but after Christ's death, resurrection, the, the New Testament documents, I mean, all the doctrine that's there, that somebody really understands it, and they don't just view Christianity as here's kind of another cult, one more take or something, but that they are really solidly grounded on what's going on here. Okay, um, someone just was asking here, is a catechumen similar to a catechism? 
I, I want to answer no there just because uh, when we're thinking of catechism, we're thinking of something much later. Um, you know, the, pro back, the back and forth process, you ask a question, someone answers a memorized question and so forth. But some of the outlines are still there. There is a questioning kind of thing going on. Um, and there are some things built around the creed, whether someone understands the creed and the implications of it. So some of the things we recognize as catechism are there, but, but in other ways different from what we're thinking of. Um, okay, a uh, conclusion for this chapter is that the catechetical, catechetical pro process, this process of becoming part of the church, is, as far as we know, the only formal theological education that happened for pastors. Okay. To become a pastor, you had to clearly get through this process. And the reason you had to get through this process was because everybody had to get through this process. So whether pastor or not, every believer goes through that. When you're done with that, then you are a candidate to be a pastor just as much as someone else is. Um, which there's good things about this. I'm glad that the concern was to educate the church broadly. I think there's something really wonderful about making, um, making membership in the church and the body a very serious thing that takes some doing to get to versus, uh, you know, after a service one night, you walk up to the pastor and say, I'm ready to join. And, and great, we'll sign you in, we'll have a vote and we're done. Um, there's something really good about this, right? But the negative, on the other hand, is that as far as we know, there's not anything special, more extensive happening for pastors other than this. Of course, we don't know ultimately what all was going on. Okay, uh, that takes us to chapter three or the third stage. And chapter three, stage three, would be going forward from um, Edict of Milan, so 312, 313, conversion of Constantine, Edict of Milan, and then the whole turn that happens after this. So hopefully this is familiar history for you. Um, when Constantine, Roman emperor, decides he's Christian for some very complex reasons, um, very political reasons probably, then the Roman government or the government of Rome and the church are in some ways fusing, okay? And all of the persecutions that come before Constantine are fading away. There are all kinds of changes then dynamics that that brings into the church. And one of the results of this, the following hundred years after the, the great turn, um, Constantine, Constantine's conversion, is that the catechumenate or the catechetical process is starting to go down. So you get by 506, okay, 200 years after Constantine's conversion, you find out that the catechumenate process going down to two years. Okay, and soon after you're getting further, you're finding it's going down to 80 days. And soon after Pope Gregory the Great, you're getting down to 40 days. And why all of this change? Okay, um, I'm sorry, when I said, I said what I said wrong, two years before, around the time of Constantine's conversion, it's two years. Okay, 200 years later, we're down to 80, then soon after down to 40. Why this change? And a lot of reasons for this are, number one, you've got a ton of people asking to join the church. Okay? A lot of people are wanting to be baptized. And they're wanting to be baptized because, it, it, honestly, humans being what we are, it doesn't cost as much anymore. And, and the Christian church is established as kind of the expected state, or let's say the, the state-sponsored religion in some way. And so somehow by being baptized and getting into the church, then people are wanting to put themselves in, in that position and so forth. Um, the hostility is a way. So there's no longer the pressure of persecution. And therefore, to some extent, there's no longer people feel the need to make sure someone is solidly grounded before they come in because they're not going to be pressured by persecution so much. But just to be able to process all the people that are coming in. One other reason that Gonzalez gives us for the decline of the catechumenate process is the German invasions. So as uh, the tribes are coming in, and this is the decline of Rome, right? Or the power of the empire is declining. Um, as time goes on, the Goths, and Germanic tribes are coming in and, and, and they are in some way, many of them are picking up 
Christianity, being converted. But you have so many conversions and, and so quick conversions that how do you process all those people? How do you get them all into the church quick enough? And some of them certainly not going to be uh, literate. Some of them, their thinking or their, their basic education is so much lower that the feeling is how can we even bring these people up to the level of understanding on a higher level? So the catechumenate just becomes something like you have to know the Lord's Prayer, uh, one or two other things, you know, maybe the Apostles' Creed or something. You have to have to know a few things, and then that'll get you in. And uh, many of the conversions that are happening are happening in mass, you know, where a whole group of people, a whole, a whole, a whole throng comes in together, or even under military coercion, they're coming in together. So you're clearly not doing the catechetical process anymore, where you are putting someone in a candidate position and watching them to see how they're, this, none of this is happening now. Um, one comment I want to just insert here that I, I believe in really strongly, and this is, a, this is a critical thing to me, for me, is the idea when you're thinking about theological education, don't make this assumption just because someone is, quote, simple in um, other aspects of their education, well, they can't learn theology. They're not capable of it. They're not up to the level. I think this is a critical mistake. And I'll talk about this a little bit further. This is for pedagogical reasons. I want to argue that made in the image of God, intelligent human beings, even with a very, very simple background, are capable of understanding this stuff, enjoying it, and loving it. And the key then is on the person teaching, finding a way to get through to them, which granted might be hard and you might find it challenging, but it can be done. There is a way to communicate effectively and you just have to find that. Um, so if I think now, think of specific examples, people that I've worked with, okay? And, and you start to talk to them from a very maybe a poor, very limited educational background you can have the feeling that this person's not going to be able to grasp my concepts. If you can find a way to communicate it well, I want to argue that anyone can and that we've got to think hard and raise the level of understanding that people have. Um, we are on the people they are capable they can understand more than you think or assume that they can understand. And we ought to, to function accordingly uh, the level that we play. A couple of comments here as uh, where in the early days uh, baptism is kind of the entrance into then entrance into Christianity. As the church is getting institutionalized and people are thinking about Christianity as kind of the, the, um, the faith that stands at the center. Um, as we're thinking of Christianity specifically tied in with the state, then you're discovering that people are coming in as infants. Or the assumption is if you're a functioning citizen of the society, then you have to be baptized already. And so therefore, you've got infant baptism happening. And the people who are mostly baptized as adults are either uh, the Germanic tribes or Jewish people who convert to Christianity. And so therefore, if you think now of the catechumenate process, um, the catechumenate process is not going to apply anymore if what you're baptizing are infants, right? Because the infants clearly aren't understanding and you're clearly not working to train the infants. And that's just taking the catechumenate process down even further or lowering the bar, the expectations on what you do with training. Um, so that takes us then to uh, three figures that we'll talk about here briefly finishing out this chapter, Ambrose, Jerome, and Augustine. And uh, Gonzalez comments on them that they were the bridge connecting the Western medieval church with antiquity. So connecting uh, what will come to happen after this period, medieval church, with what came before Christian, Greco-Roman era. And um, 
this is then starting out with Ambrose. Uh, Ambrose is talking about his own ordination and the process of his preparing. And he then, he comments, I happen that I began to teach before I began to learn. Okay. That in the endeavor to teach, I am able to learn. He enters the priesthood before he actually has any kind of training. And he's, or excuse me, he enters the position as a bishop before he has any kind of training. And he just starts serving, starts ministering. Um, Jerome would be a slightly different story. Jerome is uh, opening two different directions that are gonna become significant to the medieval church. One of them is monastic life as a way of study and as a way of scholarship. So mona monasticism predates Jerome, but Jerome and Augustine as well, take the monastic life and they make it a thing of study, scholastic, scholarship, so that then these things are fused and that becomes a core part of the medieval era, is you're in the monastery to study. Another way that Jerome massively influenced medieval Christianity, the Vulgate, uh, which if you think about the Vulgate, remember it's, it's Vulgate, it's translated into the vulgar Latin or the, the basic Latin. Okay, the irony here that's just, it's just classic, is if you think of the history of our translations, okay, from the King James back from, uh, translated from Erasmus texts. Erasmus is translating, or he's, he's pulling together Greek texts as a way, he thinks, of correcting the Vulgate, okay, and, and in many places he is. That's his endeavor, though, is to correct the Vulgate. So there's a direct line from that, from us back all the way to Erasmus, all the way to the Vulgate. Well, now jumping a thousand years, the Vulgate was an attempt to take the scriptures and put them in more accessible vulgar tongue, okay? The, the accessible tongue of people against the older Latin, the Vetus Latina, which is the older translation into Latin. And that, work, Jerome's work, has a very profound uh, influence on the, the medieval church going forward. Okay, last, Augustine, who, like Jerome that I just mentioned, is thinking of the, um, the monastic life as study and scholarship. And three works that he has that are very significant, the City of God, the Enchiridion, and On Christian Doctrine which each are focused on different aspects and have a huge long lasting influence. We've talked about Augustine at some length here already, but there's a work that doesn't come up much and it's, it's called On the Teacher. And in his discussion of On the Teacher, he is actually addressing our concept here, which is theological education, what the teacher should do in bringing someone into understanding of theology. Okay? It's kind of a, a pedagogy handbook more or less. And it becomes a textbook for people who need a, a quick introduction, understanding of the main doctrines of Christianity all the way into the medieval era, era. His view within this work of education is that there are certain people who have a gift from God for teaching and they are able to communicate, okay? But the problem is then a person who does that without an understanding of the teaching process Okay, has to learn, has to think about how to more effectively teach okay, what we would call pedagogy in our own era in order to get information across much better. And so he's going to talk through just methods and processing about how a person would teach. In the process, though, he's going to also reveal kind of his, um, his platonic edge. He's going to say philosophically that a human teacher is only... Um, kind of helping the learner discover things that have already been put in their minds by God. And so you're kind of, you're kind of calling to their memory echoes of things that they know down deep that they've forgotten. Very much a Platonic idea. Um, but anyway, some of this that's here is the very early vestiges of an attempt at thinking through pedagogy. In the, the, in the context of Christian doctrine and theolog theological education. Okay, uh, pause there. Any comments or any feedback here as we're lo looking through here? Um, Ambrose against Arianism, yes. Uh, and uh, Ambrose, there's a relationship between, relationship between Ambrose and Augustine as well. 
uh, Augustine and Jerome. There's, there's a lot, there's interaction here. So interesting stuff as well. Um, any other comments or any other things we want to want to address there under that chapter three? I'll keep on moving, if not chapter four. Um, okay, how these would play into asceticism and monasticism, it's a good question. Asceticism and monasticism exist, they pre-exist Augustine. Um, how do I say this? Augustine is in some ways, and, and Jerome, are in some ways institutionalizing it. They're making it more of a, um, a settled foundational thing. Um, and in that sense, then, they are setting the agenda for monasticism that will stretch all the way into the Middle Ages. So much of what we're thinking of when we think of monasticism goes back to Jerome and Augustine, particularly um, the, not just that you are, you are um, troubling your body, <laughs> the asceticism, asceticism side of things, but that you are working in monasticism with your mind and that study is a core part of, what, of what's at the heart of monasticism. That's a, that's a thing from Jerome and Augustine and their, stre their influence stretching out across the Middle Ages. Okay, good questions. Um, Romanization of the Germanic people. So now as the Germanic tribes are coming in, the invaders are coming in, um, they, are, they are becoming integrated into the society itself. And in just a little bit, we get to the point where the Roman Empire and the old Roman institutions are, are basically gone. So the result of this is, ironically, Latin becomes the language that they're using to communicate between each other, even though it's not their first language. And so it becomes the trade language or the common language that they're using to talk to other groups, um, but they're not most comfortable in it. Also interesting in this era is that as the Roman that the old Roman institutions recede and die through these Germanic invasions, the church starts to take its place. And so the church starts to have this outsized influence. Um, this is, this is the, this is, if, if the conversion of Constantine and the following Edict of Milan and so forth that come after, if these events are the first turning point that brings the church into the center of society, this next, the fall of Rome, the decay of old Rome, the government side, and the church stepping into the power vacuum, this is now the next stage that really seals the institutionalization of the church and the power of the church. So that pretty soon, the leaders of the church are more powerful than the political, the political rulers. And that stretches, of course, all the way into the reference. They're speaking to each other and they're speaking to each other in Latin and then just the general decay of old Roman institutions. Okay, the result is you're talking about horrible, abysmal levels of education. And their education, that stretches all the way certainly to the clergy so that the leaders of the churches have very, very poor foundations. In some cases, barely able to read themselves, barely literate. And how then are you going to talk about theological education when you have that level of, of just abysmal educational background? Two, uh, two figures during this time, Cassidorius. Cassidorius is, uh, he, found, he founds a monastery. And as he's, he's, Proceeding, he's very concerned about the level of education. Okay? He wants to see people not just focused on survival and okay, the occupation of daily life, but people focused on the word of God, studying, copying books, um, so that what the monasteries would represent would be as the decline of the society in general happens, as things fall apart and the level goes down. Um, He's hoping, they're hoping that uh, they're, he's going to be able to preserve a level of understanding, kind of a refuge where monastic life or the monasteries are going to make 
possible this lot knowledge getting preserved and not destroyed. So in the process then, he's going to use some of the traditional methods, uh, the trivium, the three-way road of understanding, grammar, astronomy, and rhetoric. Um, though these are gonna be reconfigured now and they're gonna be reconfigured as ministerial. So grammar is gonna be understood as understand, reading and, and, and understanding, interpreting the classics and the patristic writings. Astronomy, how to determine the feasts and the calendar, rhetoric, preaching, and teaching. And they're taking the traditional trivium and they're turning that into a theological direction. Same thing with the quadrivium, the four, four ways, logic, arithmetic, arithmetic, geometry, and music. And then a final field that they're going to, on the basis of this, they're going to, going to turn to studying scripture, which would be what we would think of as theological studies. Um, that was Cassidorius, okay? Secondarily, or second, was Isidore of Spain. And a similar concern here, a concern for clergy to be learning the Bible, actually even broader than that, uh, he writes something that would be like an encyclopedia of his era. And his writing becomes a major source for how later in the medieval era that we, are, we know much of um, the ancient wisdom, ancient literature comes through him just because he preserves a lot of this. So you have people that are recognizing the concern, the need for a theological education, and they're doing what they can. Uh, but the limitations are, are dire. Here's an example. Um, this is from Gregory the Great, and he's writing this. Uh, no one can claim to teach an art until they've learned to carefully study it themselves. So with what incredible boldness then do the unlearned and the unskillful stand ready to assume pastoral authority? forgetting that the care of souls is the art of arts. So how then do they declare themselves physicians of the heart? While those who do know of the use of drugs would never dare to call themselves physicians of the flesh. And, and I, to me, this is a very, this is a very striking challenge to anybody who, who dares to step forward and teach others, make sure that you know what you're doing. Okay. And, and that gives us, I think, a strong imperative for theological education. If you're going to be dealing with stuff that has, has, has to do with the core of people's thinking, their lives, their souls, their eternities, um, to take that casually and, and to pretend that you don't need training is, I think, to undervalue the power of the truth of the gospel of the word of God itself. But if I really believe that, that these things I'm working with are so profound that they shape men's hearts and minds and lives and etern eternities, really, okay, then doing a couple of years of training, it, it's just expected. That's the, that's the minimum. That's just a start. Uh, this is what I just read. Uh, was a very, very widely read book throughout the Middle Ages. And Gonzalez commented, it became a textbook for most of the clergy. Okay, uh, I think I will go into, I will start into chapter five and, or we'll maybe try to finish chapter five and then take our break just after that. So in the, the next section is early medieval schools. Um, and in the first part of the, we're gonna divide the medieval era. And the first part of the medieval era then, uh, two main, influential institutions, monastic schools and cathedral schools. So um, if you think about the, the early eras of monasticism, there's a famous rule, St. Benedict of Nursia, who is, is kind of coming up with a, a system or an expectation. And this is going to come, come up later in the Benedictine rule. This is kind of come down through other aspects of monasteries and, uh, and, and what they're expecting a person must do. And the assumption is once a person takes a vow, they're going to become part of that monastery. They, the, the vow is permanent. Okay, you, you have to stay there and you're, you, you can't move on. So the preparation to get somebody ready for being part of the monastery, kind of like a catechumenate, the person, you have to know that the person is really ready, solidly prepared to be part of it. 
And therefore, there's a, a, a kind of catechetical process that the person goes through where they're getting ready to take their vows before they join into the monastery. So in these early monastery schools, then, um, people were getting the necessary theological instruction and also the character formation, joining a community, part of being part of the, the lifestyle of the community. And in the process of that, then, they join into the monastery and become part of this group. Now, the irony then is where originally the vows are intended to get somebody in so that they'll never leave, it's permanent, you can't leave for any reason. Ironically, because these people are the most trained and the most prepared, because they've gotten this kind of training through the process, the monastery schools become a major source going forward of priests and of leaders for the church. So the monastery schools that were intended to train people to have a permanent vow end up being a method for people that, that step outside of the church. And we can see that this that positive thing. Um, part of of that of of the world of this, and the reason for this is as Europe, the main body of Europe, is kind of falling apart. Then Ireland is kind of it's removed enough that it's safe from some of that chaos. And so in this case, then some of the ancient manuscripts, the Greek manuscripts disappear elsewhere. And in Ireland, they're actually preserved. And you have larger schools, larger groups in Ireland than elsewhere. All of that monastery schools, the second major form of theological education during this era is the cathedral schools. And the idea here is within a, within a cathedral, okay, so major establishment, then you have some bishops who are establishing kind of a system of education and some examinations that you're giving to a candidate before they're ordained. And this is where they are getting the, the training to be a prospective clergy member or to become part of the church and a leader of the church. So this original idea starts small. The idea itself grows, expands beyond the cities, and the cathedrals now are becoming significant institutions, the cathedral schools. And from these are coming out larger institutions attached, cathedral schools still, but still attached this way. Uh, teaching then basic education and the central doctrines of the faith. Um, this era, there's a lot of chaos. When I think of the, the chaos that comes just before Charlemagne, Charlemagne makes some, some efforts to try to increase the level of education across his kingdom. And that includes some work like copying scripture. It includes copying manuscripts of other classic works. It includes establishing schools and it includes reforming the clergy. Okay, so during Charlemagne's rule, there's a general education policy for all of his empire. Empire is, is the wrong term, but for all for all of his control, all the lands under his control. And the results of that then is, the, one of the results of that is a benefit for all of these schools, okay? Significant efforts in education. Uh, Alcuin is a significant part of this, this work together with Charlemagne. But with the end of Charlemagne's, the, the, the Carolingian Renaissance that comes through this and the destruction that comes after, um, the result then follows that these schools are also suffering the results. And the, the chaos of the era is significantly limiting the extent to which theological education can succeed. Um, so with significant difficulty, these schools are continuing on doing what they can. Okay, um, I'm pausing there and we're gonna take just our five minute break. Is you have questions during the five minute break, if give me, after the hour, until six minutes after the hour, and um, we'll do some discussion of Brother Kenneth's question. Okay, let's begin again, and we'll try to continue on. Um, I stepped out for a little bit. Actually, I restarted my connection, so 
hopefully maybe this will run a little smoother. Um, I also in the process though missed your chat. So if you have questions that you asked, maybe you can drop them back again and again. Uh, Brother John Glass, you were asking about Cassiodorus. I don't know of a connection to Ireland. I'm just, you can do this yourself if you want, um, if that's easier, but I'll paste you in here and save you maybe a second. Um, I mean, you can see some information. It's just his Wikipedia article. Um, some fascinating, fascinating images there. So anyway, you can look through that. I'm not, a, I'm not aware of any connection to Ireland, but I may be missing something obvious. Um, and then I did not see any other connect, uh, questions there. Yeah, there you go. Um, so good. Um, so if you have other questions that I missed because of the break, or because I reset, just let me know. Um, chapter six, I'm gonna try to move a little faster here because I wanna, wanna get through all the information. Um, it's very interesting, delightful stuff. Um, yeah, okay, good, good question. I, I think there's a good answer to this as far as Peter and John unlearned. Um, in the context of Acts and what's going on there, right? The people are marveling that these are unlearned men. How are they able, recognize, how are they able to speak so eloquently or so articulately and so powerfully? Okay. And the answer in the flow of Acts is good that they're apostles. I think further than that in the flow of Acts, it's the Holy Spirit. So that when you finish through the Gospels, notice like the way it's particularly that Mark talks about the, um, that Mark talks about the, the apostles or the disciples at this point, and it's very disparaging. They're asking, they're asking bad questions. Acts 1, they're asking very bad questions. Who, chapter 1, confused about the kingdom and the nature of the kingdom. They're to gather texts from the Old Testament in profound ways with huge hermeneutical consequences, okay? And very significant use of the Old Testament texts. It's brilliant. Okay? And so that, by the time you get to, I think that's chapter four, they're marveling that they are unlearned men. Well, the, the, the narrative of Acts is to say to you, these guys have no background in education. How did they become so incredibly skillful with the word? And the answer is the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay. So I, I understand that as the, the background of that statement that they were unlearned men. Um, but if you want, if you go forward and you go into the epistles, the epistles are very much telling us that we're supposed to study, supposed to give diligence, um, and that the knowledge, the understanding is the core of someone coming to a full, fuller understanding of, of how, to, how to handle the word carefully. So I think my, my understanding of that, basically my answer there would be that that's a very um, narrow reading of one text without actually paying attention to the narrative of how the entire, how Acts is building and under explaining some of this. Okay, don't know if that answers your question or helps you, but um, right. Chapter six. Okay, so by the time we're getting to this point, uh, we're in the middle of the, we're in the middle of the Middle Ages. We're coming into the beginning of scholasticism, 1100 to 1250. Uh, you have the beginning of the Crusades, so there's contact now between the West and the Muslim world, and that's bringing about commercial, massive commercial changes, um, kind of the, the rebirth or the beginning again of, this is very practical, money as opposed to barter. Okay. Um, and all of these texts and this learning and this information that's coming back, ironically, through the interchange between the West and the Muslim world is bringing about um, significant educational development and what comes what we know today as classes. For people that Ellis uh, brings out, or talks about it to some extent, to some extent, Anselm, Abbeyard, Hugh of St. Victor, who we met in a previous lecture, and Peter Lombard, who we also met in a previous lecture. Um, Anselm is working hard to uh, systematic Christian truth to bring together doctrine in a uh, in an integrated way. Okay. Abiard is actually incredibly brilliant, but having more of a concern to show off his own intelligence, 
And Sick at None is Abillard's, Abillard's uh, work to show that the, the, the great writers of the past, the fathers, do not agree with each other, which becomes a core part of this, the scholastic method as a whole, pulling together different quotes, different citations from the fathers and other authorities, and trying to understand how they fit. Okay, Hugh of St. Victor, we met him before. And he is um, thinking through the use of reason in theology. But he also opens a doorway for Abbeyard and actually sets a foundation for other greater scholastic innovations, greater scholastic work that comes all the way down to Aquinas and other significant theologians. Lombard, who is the most influential of uh, all of the forerunners, all of the foundation layers for um, scholasticism, writes his four sentences, four books of sentences. And um, in that, then, it's kind of the first systematic theology that, as we learned in a previous lecture, the later scholastics are just going to end up commenting on. Their commentary on Lombard, on the sentences, is going to be the way that they follow through in education. Um, so these different significant foundations for scholasticism have huge influence because they are now going to set the, the pace for the way that education is going to be done. At the universities. And the universities founded early, if you want to, uh, the first uh, expression of this, the University of Paris. Um, are going to set the foundation not just for theology, but for learning in general. But theology is at the core. So the idea of the universities is kind of a, a, I think, a guild, a group of teachers come together. And so previously, the teachers and the students maybe are spread out, but now they're going to come together in kind of a guild, one place. Okay? And in that union of, of, of teachers in universities, they're going to establish an institution where you can study all kinds of different areas, all kinds of different disciplines, but primarily theology. Um, the tension within the universities and within the method is significant. And one of the reasons for that is the method that was happening or the way that scholasticism was carried out in the era. So education is carried out through a disputatio, disp disputatio process where, um, so you're offered a question, okay, and in many cases, arguments, viewpoints that seem to contradict each other. So maybe you quote two great authors in the fathers or in tradition that seem not to agree. And then you work through trying to show why those authorities actually do not contradict okay, and why those things do fit together. And there's a questioning process so that as you're a bachelor, then you're going to have a lower level of interaction with this problem. As you come to a master's level, you're going to have a higher level of interaction and higher expectations that you can be questioned. People can, can give questions to you and you're on the spot to give answers, you've got to be able to deliver. But the process of that then in the dispute audio, the word dispute in it, the process of that is that you are, as people are, are growing intellectually through this, you're also um, very much at odds with other people, you're, you're working against other people who are asking you challenging questions. And this also has the effect, the net effect, of getting deeper and deeper into detailed questions that have less and less connection back to normal life or actually the life of the church. So the result then of all of this is, I'll, I'll quote Gonzalez here, a, a situation parallel to what has happened in recent times where university studies become increasingly specialized, but at the same time increasingly distant from the, I'm not quoting that, end quote, from the life of the church and from people who actually practice pastoral ministry. And the irony then is that you have very well-prepared teachers, people that are very well um, educated, and they've thought through a lot of questions, but they're completely disconnected from the actual life of the church and from real world. That then creates secular teachers or teachers who do not belong to the monastic communities 
um, and, and not secular in today's meaning of the world, as in um, not, not religious. Everybody, it's assumed, is religious. But people who are covering their, their, their expenses through the fees that they charge their students, so you have money at stake in these disputes, and therefore the debate that's going on between these teachers it's just heightened even further and becomes even more disconnected from the actual life of the church and the actual needs of the church. Okay. Much of the theology that is studied, that's practiced in this era and the era of the universities has no relevance for ministerial practice. It's completely disconnected from the actual needs of the church and the work that people are doing. Um, some interesting points from this era that are just fascinating. Uh, you want to talk about Aquinas uh, and the Summa Theologica. Massive, massive work, okay? but nobody can really own this because it's such a huge work. And furthermore, even if they did, there's nothing in it that's really necessary or helpful for the pastor. It's a, this, this work is a huge work of theology, but no pastor would benefit from it. What you're really talking about is... Um, the crown of learning, but disconnected from the needs of the church. And that takes us into the last centuries of the Middle Ages. The last part of the Middle Ages, and some have called kind of the dying of the Middle Ages or the fall, the, the autumn, um, the last season before the winter. You're, you're, you're coming down and things are grinding down further and further. The proportion of clergymen during this era who have studied in the university is very low. And the people who in, in, in rural areas, okay, in a village where most people live at this point, uh, the parish priest, the leader of their churches, in other words, most people's pastor in the era, most people's religious leader in the era, is very, very undereducated. Whatever education was happening at this level, very minimal. Okay, so Gonzalez comments, the studies might be limited to learning by heart the Lord's Prayer, the Creed, the Ten Commandments, some of the more common prayers. Okay, and the priest is teaching within the church, teaching pe these people basic things. But in many cases, the priest himself doesn't know much more than that. The priest knows how to do a mass. The priest knows how to follow a couple of, um, you know, a couple of holidays and do a couple of rites. And that's about it. There's not much education beyond that. So in the very era, ironically, 13th and 14th centuries, the very era where the universities are flourishing and increasing, the same era, you have many illiterate priests, even bishops that are illiterate while the universities, universities are flourishing. Just because the large institutions are doing well and becoming larger doesn't mean that the education is actually coming down to the people who hopefully would use it. And um, other issues in the era uh, that the bishoprics basically become a source of income. So you could buy a bishopric, you buy your position, and then you're able to collect the money off of it. It's like an annuity or something. You buy the position and then that just generates money for you in an ongoing way. So that even children in some cases are consecrated as bishops. They, they have nothing that they're doing. It's just basically their father buying them a position, an annuity, so that they're going to collect money on it. And the bishop, therefore, could have his position and never have ever been to the place that he's supposed to be having oversight over. He's never even, he's never even visited it. Um, so as a result of that, if you think through this, the need of the bishop to actually be educated to fulfill his role, it's irrelevant because he's not going to do a role anyway. He's just going to buy the position and collect the money from it. Um, and this is the case then to the extent that, that you've got, here's an example, 1293, the Cathedral School of Valencia, the main teacher in the cathedral school, okay, it's a th cathedral school, it's, an, it's, a, it's a place for education. He's the main teacher within that school. He's illiterate. You've got people that within the cathedral itself, you've got 
clergymen who barely know how to read. Okay. And they're in these schools supposedly to educate other people. Um, a little ironic point as I just go by here, you can read about it in the notes that I'll send you. But um, I mentioned the idea that the bishoprics were sometimes held by children because it was just a source of income. Um, ironically and hilariously, John Calvin, as a child, when he was 12 years old, um, received a position like this. And it was because his father and his family set it up for him as, you know, basically like a source of income to pay for his education so that John Calvin could go on to study, study, uh, in his case, as a lawyer. So a man who later is used as, yeah, it's like a trust funder in annuity or something. Um, a man who's later used as a major reformer of some of these problems. Actually, when he's a child, he, he, was, he was a participator, or at least his parents were, his family was. And just, just a, actually a funny irony in the way some of this works out. Um, okay, uh, other aspects of the scholastic era or what's happening in this. I've already mentioned rivalry that comes between professors and the competition, in, in many cases, competition that involves money because you're getting paid uh, for your work as a teacher. And the result, uh, read a couple of uh, comments here, concluding the chapter, the theologians of the times made little impact on the daily life of Christian believers on the thought and pastoral practices of most of the clergy or on devotion. One scholar says the scholasticism of the 14th and 15th centuries became extremely heavy and boring. And yes. But finishing out uh, the, the last aspect of the medieval era would be responses, people that are looking for answers to this or kind of the noise of um, reform. And one expression of this is the brethren of the common life. Uh, we'll just move through this quickly. If you want to go back and read it, you can look at this in some more detail. Um, but the brethren of the common life, they're concerned very much for educational work and very much for the vernacular languages. And so they're working hard to try to help people read, learn how to read, and then be able to read the, the works of the great thinkers, Augustine, Gregory the Great, and so forth. Um, setting up these schools has a massive influence, not just for theology, but other areas of learning, reading, mathematics, literature. Significant people who studied in some of these schools, Nicholas of Cusa, Thomas Akempis, Erasmus, Luther, uh, one of the reforming popes, okay, were all influenced by these schools. Imitation of Christ comes out, I just mentioned Thomas Akempis, comes out of this and is a concern very much for not just study, but study for the purpose of uh, real life change that will, will actually your heart being connected and oriented towards the truth of theology. And uh, Gonzalez comments here that the Brethren of the Common Life made a great impact on basic education. Even the practice we have until today of dividing elementary education into eight grades uh, has its roots in their work. Okay, so some of our, the way that we do graded instruction is already, as actually tied all the way back. Um, and the practice of employing more advanced students as tutors for the younger students is tied back to the Brethren of the Common Life. Uh, coming out from them then, Erasmus. And Erasmus, we know him for his work in a lot of different areas, certainly pulling together the Greek texts that underlie many of the early translations and his excellent work that way. Um, this is one of his concerns, one of his reasons for publishing the Greek New Testament is the concern for getting out from scholasticism, the endless debates, and going back to the original sources, back to the teachings of Jesus, back to the fathers, going back to the original documents and thinking about the core, the, the foundation. But what's interesting, and I didn't know this before I read the book, Erasmus was interested in educating children. Okay? So he has sig significant work where he's thought through a method for educating children and for educating ministers. He's thought a lot about education. And he's saying that 
theological studies should not be grounded on logic, speculative theology. Instead, start with the classical languages, history, uh, ethics, and, and understanding the core of theology and of the things that, that, we, that we, ought, we ought to know. There's a lot to be said that's positive there, even though it's um, not, not right, later in his life, certainly not Erasmus is not viewing himself as part of the Reformation. And that takes us to the, ne to the, to the next chapter, the Protestant Reformation. Um, for an opening comment here about the Reformation, the Reformation starts, if you're thinking about Luther anyway, as the start of the Reformation. It starts in a university environment, right? Uh, Luther is lecturing for several years before he starts to come to some of the conclusions that he reached. And Luther continued to be a professor and lecture all the way through his life. The really significant person to focus on though, in terms of theological education would not be Luther, but Melanchthon. And Melanchthon joins at the University of Wittenberg uh, together with Luther, Luther very soon after uh, the, the, the Reformation begins or that Luther begins to, um, to, to express that. Uh, setting up a whole curriculum, okay? And, and Melanchthon reviews the whole set of studies, okay? From all aspects to set up a whole method for educating, okay? Part of this whole return to the sources idea of humanism. Well, for Melanchthon, return to the authority of scripture, return to the teachings of Christ, return to the ancient languages, Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. He creates massive numbers of textbooks and literature, okay? A Greek grammar that became the, the basic textbook for studying Greek all the way into the 17th century. And as I said, a whole, a whole system, a whole curriculum that is adapt, adapt, adopted at the university and then becomes the method for the University of Wittenberg and other schools influenced by it. Not just that, but he goes on to seek and to establish methods and, and education at all levels, not just at the university level, but all the way down all levels of education for anybody who can read and all the way down to what we would, we would call secondary and even primary education. At one point, Melanchthon is part of a group that goes out and the question is to see what is the state of education outside. Okay. So he visits a particular province in order to, to understand what's happening. And he's horrified by the, the fact that there are school teachers who don't even know how to read. Okay. They've just memorized some of the basic creeds, the Ten Commandments, the Lord's Prayer, a couple of other things. But they don't understand the basics. Not, they don't understand justification by faith. They don't understand even the core aspects of theology. And so his response to that is to set up a whole method before a person enters into ministry or ordination that a person has to have a level of education. They have to pursue theological studies before they can enter into, into the ministry, which sounds obvious to us, but at the time it's pretty, pretty dramatic. It's a major step. And there are other, other um, aspects we could comment on here in on the Zwinglian side of the Reformation, Bullinger also set up a theological curriculum, similar strains there, classical literature, the biblical classical languages, Latin, Greek, and Hebrew, um, spending time on the ancient writers, including Augustine, and, and similar emphases to uh, Melanchthon and his emphasis there. When uh, someone commented here about what about Calvin and Calvin's role, well, for sure as well. Um, Calvin's Institutes has a massive influence, and it's, it's probably one of the most influential documents in the history of the church after the Reformation. Maybe Augustine's Confessions um, would be another. But it's, it's, such a, it's a, such an extensive treatment of theology, kind of a systematic theology, um, kind of a Protestant full expression of theology. And together with that, then he's also concerned about 
catechizing. And now here, if you were to use the word catechizing, you can go ahead and put in what we're thinking of catechizing. Um, where you're actually asking questions, a back and forth process. And connecting in that preaching together with educating believers. Okay, so this is an idea I'll borrow a little bit from further on in the Puritan era. People that are recognizing, yes, preaching, let's preach. But in order to make sure that people have understood what I just said, I need to meet with them in person. And I need to ask questions. I need to interact. Okay, because just by them sitting there and listening to preaching, they may or may not be connecting in with what I'm saying at all. And there is a power to being able to, to ask those questions like that. Um, Calvin sets out plans that Biza later is implementing. And it's a whole set of uh, lectures. It's a whole academy. It's a whole method. So that within a few years, you're, you're getting up to significant institutions with significant numbers of students, hundreds of students that are studying. And then one other comment under the Reformation, and this would be uh, the Anabaptists. The Anabaptists, they, they did not undervalue necessarily education, but the reason that the Anabaptists would never develop fuller educational programs like this is just basically they're, they're, they're running for their lives. Uh, it's parallel in some ways to the very first era of the church where you can't establish institutions for a disciplined educational process just because the persecution keeps you moving. And there's, there's, there's not time to do that kind of discussion. Okay, um, I'm going to skip over the next, yeah, good, wow, very good. Uh, so we'll talk about Comenius a little bit later. Um, good, good comments here. Um, I'm gonna skip over the Counter-Reformation because of just time, but it is interesting here. It's in the Counter-Reformation that you first have the word seminary, and the word seminary, listen to the word, a seedbed, used time in English through a cardinal, and this is during the, uh, uh, England and the English Reformation, you're going back and forth between Catholicism and Protestantism, constant back and forth. Okay, well, during the era of Mary Tudor, uh, a cardinal uses this as a concern. We're going to have a seedbed of education. And the irony then is that, that that word gets picked up soon after. Borromeo takes up the idea, and now in a Protestant respect, we're establishing seminaries that are actually um, able to refute, or excuse, I, Borromeo from a Catholic standpoint, setting up seminaries with significant influence that are then able to trade, provide, and train and provide priests. And this is leading to some significant uh, reform within the reform movement or the counter-reformation. Jesuits are also a significant part of this. This, if you wanna think about the counter-reformation uh, the Jesuits are very directly concerned with um, education as a core part of their mission. And they're setting up not just on the advanced level, but all the way down um, multiple levels, multiple cycles of education so that a person could study from the age of 14 up until 26, they would complete the full cycle of studies and be prepared to do academic work. Okay, that's Counter-Reformation. I'm going to Protestant scholasticism, and I moved quickly through. If you want to look at the um, Counter-Reformation, there's more information there in the document that I'll send you. But the, the era following the Reformation is sometimes called uh, an era of Protestant scholasticism. After Melanchthon and after Calvin and the other, uh, the other major reformers have passed away, then increasingly their followers are taking the Reformation in a direction that's less healthy or less robust. There are significant, um, there, is sig there is significant chaos within Lutheranism between those who are following Melanchthon and those who consider themselves authentic followers of Luther and uh, pure Lutherans. Okay. Well, there, there's ten significant tension between them. In a, and furthermore, not just within Lutheranism, between Lutherans and the Reformed side. So all of this chaos then becomes 
um, kind of turning the Reformation back in on itself and in some ways following what happened previously, where people are getting further and further down into tiny details that are more and more disconnected from the actual life of the church. And now there's some, some nuance that belongs here um, as far as the phrase or the, the label Protestant scholasticism, that phrase has been adjusted. You can read about that uh, here and in other sources. So not to overstate the case, but there is a period after the Reformation when within Protestantism, um, some people are losing their way. <laughs> and there is a focus on unnecessary levels of detail that are not directly connected to the life of the church. So building, um, are kind of um, less broad and less rich use of scripture and working into those kinds of details. At the same time, um, you, have some, you have some significant work that is positive. And so Brother Glass, Comenius, or uh, Jan Amos Kominsky, a uh, Moravian bishop, and he is called by some, called the father of modern education. It's because he, he proposes a whole education plan that goes all the way down from childhood, all the way up into advanced studies. And envision what we would understand as, uh, even today, grading, okay? So 24 years of total education, four different periods, the vernacular school that children would go to. And then uh, a next level, or excuse me, the very first level with, with your mother. So you wanna know, say pre-K, okay, a vernacular school that all children go to. Um, a third level, a Latin school, or a level in which someone is kind of developing their professional skills. And then finally, university, where someone would study, the advanced students would study medicine, law, theology. Okay, so the highest level of, un under uh, of instruction. And then a method within all of that. So um, a schedule, how this would work, exams, professors, and how they would quiz somebody, kind of a comprehensive process where they would be questioned. I mean, it's a, it's a very massive concern for a whole educational process that's very extensive. Um, pietism would connect in here as well. I just mentioned a Moravian. Well, going forward even further, and kind of a response to what I just called Protestant scholasticism, or the hardening of categories in the post-Reformation. Pietism is a response and a concern to make sure that our theology is not disconnected from the life of the church. And led by the Moravians and others, um, but one significant figure that we'll talk about here is Spainer. There's a concern now to make sure that sermons are not just long theological discussions of points that nobody cares about, but that the life of the church stands at the core of ministerial thought and preaching. Spainer writes Pious Desires, Pia Desideria, which becomes a very, very influential book. And there are six different points here that we could talk about. For time, I'm gonna talk about uh, the last two. But his other points, emphasis on scripture, priesthood of the believer, uh, distinction between just knowing Christianity and its doctrines versus actually having faith, personal faith, controversies in love instead of in rancor. But the last two points here would be here, uh, number five, the need to reform schools and universities so that you're not just forming the mind, but that you're actually changing the life that a candidate for ministry ought to have an exemplary life, not just a well-trained one. Someone who spends time with you and actually shapes the way you think about life. And then number six, that sermons would be an opportunity, I love this, not to show the pastor's erudition by means of quotes in foreign languages and his mental acuity by detailed and orderly outlines. It's great, okay. Um, so your question here, yeah, a person who ought to have a well-trained mind, but also exemplary life was number five, not just, not just academic preparation, but living it out. 
Okay, but within sermons, that sermons are not just showing off your learning and not just working through some kind of controversy over theological minor details. Okay, but the preacher preaching is grounded on careful study and exegesis of the text. And the goal is to edify the body of Christ, appealing to people's minds, yes, but more their hearts. You're actually trying to see their lives changed. Okay, this is stuff that, this, that we very deeply recognize. And one of the things that Spainer does, and I, I think this is, this, is, this is kind of where the meat of the book really started to connect with me. Um, a concern that within the church, there is probably a core of believers who would want to live even more faithfully, and people who would be really driven about their Christianity and their desires to understand it better. Okay. And so he starts to work towards what he called a, a church within a church. Okay. Not that these people are better than the other believers, but a church within a church is, if you want to say, a subgroup who is even more serious about really making Christianity a deep part of their life. And establishing these, these little groups, these subgroups take off because you do have a group of people that are, that are really wanting more. Practically speaking, I, this helps me. Um, the temptation when you're pastoring, the temptation is to think about the people on the edges and you're trying to move the people from the edges in, right? You know, they, they come sporadically and they're disinterested. And so you're really wanting to see those people get serious. Well, that's not a bad idea, but I would suggest maybe the greater benefit is to focus on and core then to see such a solid foundation established that perhaps some of the people on the edges are drawn in. Either way, let's provide for the people who, I think that's, that's wisdom. I think there's something there. Um, I'm going to return to this idea a little bit later on with the idea of theological education, not just being a professional thing, but a thing that we provide to all of God's people. Okay, that was one expression of it. And another expression that came through, um, we're talking about pietism, Spainer, Moravians, and going further, Franke, August, uh, August Hermann Franke in Prussia, is establishing eventually, and going beyond, establishing uh, at the University of Leipzig, significant, and later the University of Halle, uh, significant theological discussion that's going to become the center of a whole, even, and this relates to the previous lectures, a whole missionary enterprise. So Protestant missions is connected into this theological education. And that theological education at Halle is increasing a strong emphasis on teaching, pastoral theology, the whole purpose of the courses to be forming up a person okay, so that good instruction is not just intellectual, but it's knowing Christ through vision, prayer, study of the Bible, evangelism. Okay, and you're going to see that then coming out through missions and the significant work that the Moravians do. Uh, here's an interesting connection between the Moravians and the next part of, you want to consider this part of pietism. It is, though. It's related. Uh, Wesley. So Wesley, his own salvation testimony is, is directly uh, related to the Moravians. When Wesley begins to see God work through his ministry, the Great Awakening in North America, one of the things he's doing is working hard to make sure that there are people solidly prepared to teach Okay. And there's a lot that could be said here underneath this. Wesley had a lot of innovations. Uh, one of them we might recognize as kind of a form of a smaller group. You know, that you have a smaller group of people that you personally are discipling. Well, the person who's going to lead that group needs to be prepared themselves. Wesley publishes a list of 50 books that every preacher he thinks should read to be prepared. It, particularly in North America. Uh, Wesley is trying to establish these churches and, and the growth of Wesleyanism, Wesleyanism in North America is so profound that he can't keep up. Okay. And the result then is actually earlier in North America than in the UK or than in Britain, he is establishing educational enterprises. Okay. 
schools that are there to train people for ministry, actually more than that. But hundreds of colleges and universities, actually until today, all around the world, that are related to Methodism. And that has to do with very historical reasons, because on the frontier of the U.S., how do you find enough people to be able to pastor these small groups as, as the Great Awakening is, is, is spreading rapidly across North America? Um, that takes us to the last chapter that we'll talk about here besides the one you read, and that's modern theological education. Um, Friedrich Schleiermacher had a significant influence, unfortunately, on theological education. And I'm not going to talk about much of that. Um, Schleiermacher is called the father of practical theology. Um, but much of what he's thinking of theology is something that we would not recognize as true theology at all. Um, but one of, the, one of the, the results or the implications of some of this is that as you come into the modern era, uh, theology and theological education has to find its place with all the other disciplines. So theology becomes just another discipline. And the power of science or the prestige of science in the modern era means that to be a serious discipline, like a good discipline, the view is, you have to have a scientific method or an objective, verifiable, universal type method. And, and you can see this coming out then in all the forms of modernism and liberalism. Because what you're doing, you're desperately trying to find a way to make theology feel more objective and scientific. Well, we can have these methods of criticism and you follow these rules and therefore you're able to get down to what the document really was. Not what we think the document is or the form it's in now today, but just what we, what we really know it was because we have these methods. Uh, the irony now is that a theologian has to justify his existence. Because if a theologian or the Department of Theology is not viewed as a significant enough science, then it, it doesn't really deserve a place together with all the other sciences. Um, Gonzalez goes on to observe that as time goes on, other theories and other disciplines start to impinge on theology. And often there's a closer connection between those disciplines and the secular expression than the theology curriculum itself. Okay, so for instance, uh, church management becomes more like business management, right? Homiletics becomes more related to speech or to rhetoric. And all of that then is kind of a, a lowering of the status of theology or theological education in service to the church. And it's a making that a servant to the other disciplines. Another problem of the era is just the, the absolute explosion of knowledge. Okay, so there's a period of time, Renaissance era, when someone could be pretty well versed on most of the things human beings know, right? You get to a point where uh, <laughs> you recognize, even if you spend your whole life studying the book of Ecclesiastes, you cannot know all the stuff that's known just about Ecclesiastes because there's just too much information. So how do people handle this within academia? And the answer is specialization, right? So now you don't just have zoologists. You have people study, they study fish. They study one aspect, one category within fish, right? Um, and sciences, they study biology. No, not biology. They study molecular biology. No, they don't study molecular. They study genetics. They study one part of genetics. Specialization then means that there are no universal experts. And the implications of that are number one, the pastor no longer has the privileged place of being one of the most highly educated persons in his church, right? Because you can't, you can't be. There's no way. Second, um, the result then is that everybody is expected to have their kind of their area. I have my area, you have your area. I'm an expert here, you're an expert there. Okay. And so the assumption becomes that the pastor, well, he knows about theology and religion, but not so much about life. 
Okay. And it leaves the pastor in a, a tension or difficult place um, because for the pastor then to speak to other areas of life, he may not know much about that area of life. Okay. So how do you handle that? The person you're talking to knows their business field. They know their area. How do you help them through that? And one of the recommendations Gonzalez gives that's, that's a critical part of theological education is to help a person become conversant enough that they can apply theology across disciplines and in other ways. A third consequence of the specialization is that within seminaries, you end up with different teachers that cover different areas. Okay, so theology itself works like this, where now you have the history department and a history scholar may not really know nor care that much about the New Testament documents, right? But the New Testament guy doesn't care about church history. And the guy who thinks about philosophy and ethics doesn't care much about either of the other two, okay? which is really dangerous, particularly when it comes to the biblical text. <laughs> We've all got to be very conversant with the biblical text. But with all of these disciplines, we need all of them in order to do a good job. And he comments here, and I love this, I'm going to read this um, in total. He comments that the majority of theological schools in seminaries and seminaries in former mission fields, and what he means that, then is places where the church is not as old, okay, the global south, across Latin America, across Southeast Asia, across Africa, places where the church is not as old. Some of these um, they struggle then to have all the resources and the size to be able to support a history guy or a Old Testament guy, right? And they are tempted in some institutions to feel like that makes them inferior because if we were really a big institution like the big European and North American institutions, we would have those people. They struggle to support the, the church history guy, the Old Testament guy, the experts, because they're not big enough, these smaller schools. Gonzalez's comment is, before you try to copy the North American institutions and the European institutions, pause just a second, okay? And don't assume that this is necessarily good. That maybe it's good to stay broad and not specialize so much. Maybe it's a better idea not to have a history department that never talks in the New Testament department. And I think that's a really good insight uh, to recognize that maybe some of these, um, these new areas, okay, these new fields, they might have a healthier position or viewpoint on theological education. Okay, and then last here, um, an impact that comes from specialization. Um, and this is an impact on literature that's being produced. So a large portion of books and other materials that are published today on biblical and theological subjects are not useful for ministerial training or practice or for the life at large. And that's because it's kind of the publish or perish principle, that if you're going to be successful within academia, then you've got to keep on writing the journal articles and they have to be different than anything that's happened before. So you've got to write in order to impress your peers, but it's not necessarily connected to the life of the church, right? Or the need of people for ministry. And the result then is a vast number of books written to make an impression on colleagues, but not actually to serve the church. Okay, um, that, is, that leads right into some of the insights that you got from your reading. Some of, Gonzalez's, uh, some of Gonzalez's strong recommendations. And just some comments here to make uh, some, some insights to be drawn out of Gonzalez's work and some things that we ought to take away. Okay, number one, I highly, highly appreciated his insight that theological education is not just a thing for professionals, that theological education is a thing for the church. And I would strongly encourage us to think about theological education that way. In terms of, uh, it's not a thing I do for my fellow colleagues who are going to serve as pastors, but that we have a calling, if God has given you the intellectual gifts and the educational experience, we have a calling to take strong
make it available for churches. Make teaching our, uh, maybe I lost you for a second. Hope you can hear me now. To make teaching available to people in our churches so that if you have taken classes like this and others, okay, view yourself and your ministry as a way to take solid concepts and give them to people in your churches that need to hear it. Okay? I'm, I am shocked sometimes. The assumption can be that this lay person in the church is not going to be interested in theology. Okay? And then I, I will preach something. And some of the, the sermons I've preached that engaged people the most, or at least I got the most questions afterwards, were on questions that I thought were going to be too academic and they were going to be bored. Okay? Explaining in a in a, a college context, but in preaching, explaining what scripture is talking about when it talks about wine, okay? because it's all over the Bible. Well, people were really, really interested in this okay? because they read their Bibles and they see it and they don't get it. And they've always wondered, what is the Bible talking about when it says wine? Okay, well, they want to know, right? Talking about paradox and the problem of evil and the incarnation and the Trinity, people will perk up because they've wondered about that too. Right? And they, they're not understanding. So if you can make some of these things available to people, I think people are actually hungry, really hungry for solid, robust theology. And part of our calling or our responsibility is to make that kind of thing available for them and help them. Okay. This is a really critical insight. So church is about education. Good. <laughs> Giving people solid theology to ground them. They want it. They need it. We ought to make it happen. Um, there is responsibly something he, I mentioned earlier here. The idea of teaching even in smaller groups, okay, bringing it down, smaller groups that, where you can have a mentorship. Okay? And one of the ideas that Gonzalez brings up a lot is the, the power of a mentor in understanding theology and helping somebody come to this understanding. Another comment that I thought was excellent is the fact that cycles will happen. Things come and go. Okay? So there's periods of the church when we have institutionalized education happening. And there's periods of the church when it's much more informal. Cycles come and go, change is normal, change is good. Theological education needs a revolution from time to time. I'm thinking that because of the internet, we're at a place where there is significant revolution that will happen in the next 10 to 20 years. There will be some changes. And you can see some of this happening as the history of the church goes along in respect to theological education. Theological education takes lots of forms. And the idea of a seminary is not as old as the church. Seminaries are not the church. <laughs> Seminaries exist to serve the church. They help the church, but they are not the church. The church stands at the core. And from time to time, seminaries take on a life of their own, or I should say better, theological discussion, professional theological discussion takes on a life of its own that gets disconnected from the church. And that's always bad. <laughs> that's never healthy. Okay. So theological education has to be deeply rooted in the core of what the church is and in church life, in the essence of what people are doing in church life. So if you find yourself teaching, I would suggest excellent is to also keep yourself deeply rooted in church life, okay? Leading, pastoring, not just teaching as an end in itself. This is not superior. That, that along with the education, you are also deeply involved with people directly. Um, and then one last comment to say, the church ought to carefully evaluate the way that theological education has aligned with secular expectations. Okay, so one of the things that you can, one of the trends you can see as you go through this discussion is that as the secular, secular, as the, the world itself and its expectations changes, the church tends to reshape theological education to fit it and put that into our own era so we have these parallel degrees, right? You can, you can get a degree in biology, okay? Bachelor's, master's, doctorate. Get a degree in communication, bachelor's, master's, doctorate. So what do we, we have the same thing with theology. And I'm not saying that's bad. 
I'm not going to say it's good either. Somehow our expectation works that, you know, if, if a system or a program is not accredited and it's not following the same track that all of the other disciplines is, then that doesn't count as a reasonable program and as theological education. Okay. And I think the secular academy has guided the way that we think about theological education. I'm hoping, we'll see, that in the next 10 to 20 years, there'll be a change in that that somehow there's not going to be the expectation of the accreditation process and under the aegis of the government, the control of the government and the requirements of what accreditation looks like that, like that. But that somehow within the church, there would be some way of having a full, robust, solid theological education program that is also controlled and rooted in the church itself. And that would itself then fit the needs of the church and not necessarily what the secular academy would drive. What that looks like, I don't know. But the lifetime learners is a key of that, a key component of that. And some of these other concepts that Gonzalez talks about throughout here. Brother John Glass, good comments here. A good education comes from reading good books, reading the best books, good. And just remaining a lifetime learner. Okay. Uh, that's all we have time for here. I have not done this book justice. Uh, if you want to read, particularly that last chapter that you read, if you did not read it, make sure you get to it. It's a good chapter. And then if you finish that out, other chapters as well. Right after we get off here, I will drop the full notes into the Dropbox. And so you can go to the same um, folder that everything was in earlier. And that will be in there. Or actually here, I'll just give you the, the link right now. Um, you can also access it this way right away. So if this is a help to you, uh, I would recommend maybe taking a look through some of the notes that we have here. And then from there, if you still have interest, you could go, uh, go further and read the book. And um, if I can be a, a help to you in accessing it, let me know. Okay, I will paste here is the Dropbox link for the full notes. That's it right there. And you can download that. Uh, and then if you have any questions about this, just send me a note and we'll stay in touch that way. Uh, that's it for me right now. Um, our next time we have Dr. Sidwell coming and he's going to talk to us about just a broad concept in respect to the development of theology across church history. And I think you'll enjoy it very much. Uh, I think you'll very much enjoy his teaching. Okay, looking forward to seeing you all again on Thursday. Thank you so much for your time. Shoot me a note if you have any questions and we'll stay, uh, we'll stay in contact. Thank you.